I love talking about psychedelics. This is the fun thing. But I want to talk about the language that we use first, because the, re the research community has eventually concluded that psychedelic is the right term to use. It's been a bit of an evolution. The word psychomimetic was the first word to describe a psychedelic when it was used in the 50s and 60s because it was like psychosis and it was used by psychiatrists and they thought it would help them to understand schizophrenia. And then they realized that it didn't. So the word hallucinogen was invented because people actually do see stuff that's not there. And um, after a while, that was actually given up in favor of the word psychedelic, which means mind manifesting. Other ones are empathogenic. They help people bond to each other. And then somebody coined the term entheogen, which means manifesting of the spirit. But looking at all of those words, the, one, the term that the researchers use is psychedelic, because while it has cultural baggage, it also is the most accurate description of what we do. Now, as you know, psychedelics are illegal. And the reason why they're illegal is because during the 1950s and 60s, when the, when the hippies started, they did something with psychedelics that had never been done before. Because psychedelics have been used by indigenous communities for centuries, and they've been always used within the context of healing and bonding to culture. And the younger generation in the 60s linked it to an antisocial message. Tune in, turn on, and drop out was Tim Leary's message. And the backlash against both the objection to the Vietnam War and the antisocial message produced a problem. And there was tons of propaganda. Give me one good reason why I shouldn't try LSD. Well, I'll give you 16. And it wasn't just the official propaganda, but some of the, sometimes the media participated. LSD-fed ape rapes TV actress. LSD made me a prostitute. Girl gives birth to frog. And it wasn't just that the psychedelics were criminalized, but the research was actually suppressed. It was so difficult to do psychedelic research that nobody did anymore. So can I reflect on any time in history when a research has been criminalized? Well, as a matter of fact, I can. The banning of the telescope in 1616, and then for the subsequent 143 years, it was illegal to report what you saw through the lens of the telescope. Here's a great quote. Psychedelics, or LSD, is to the study of the mind what the telescope is to astronomy, and the microscope is to biology. Well, psychedelics are back. There is a psychedelic renaissance in the research community. Researchers around the globe are becoming once again excited by the potential that psychedelics offer for healing, for mysticism, for a variety of different things that can help us as human beings live better lives. If I was going to date the beginning of the psychedelic renaissance, the New York Times article in 2010, hallucinogens have doctors tuning in again. That was the beginning of the mainstream media's attention to psychedelics in a positive way. So I'd just like to take you through a journey. 2012, New York Times Magazine, how psychedelic drugs can help patients face death. The New York Times again, can mushrooms treat depression? The New Yorker, the trip treatment by Michael Pollan, who as you know, or as you, I hope you know, subsequently wrote a book on it. Because I'm Canadian, I'll talk about Globe and Mail. Psychedelic drugs may be helpful in treating addiction, anxiety, and PTSD. Newsweek, psychedelics promise a paradigm shift in treating mental illness. 
McLean's Magazine, Is Ecstasy an Answer in 2015? The science of the psychedelic renaissance in The New Yorker. And then after Michael Pollan's book came out, Michael Pollan drops acid and come back from his trip convinced. And believe it or not, Fox News has actually been favorable. MDMA for PTSD, how ecstasy ingredient works in the brain. So it's interesting to look at the number of universities that have active psychedelic work. Everything from exploring the research to doing stage one, two, and three clinical trials. This slide is the summary of the psychedelic renaissance. It is back, it is legitimate, it is absolutely okay for researchers to dive into the great pool of psychedelics and swim around and generate data. In Canada, one of the most influential moments was the CMAJ, the Canadian Medical Association Journal's cover issue looking at the psychedelic renaissance. Now this is the conservative voice of medicine across Canada. And they had two articles in here exploring the recent history of the psychedelic renaissance. Psychiatric Annals, Analysis Explores Potential Psychedelic Treatments for Mental Illness. Psychedelic Renaissance, Are Psychedelic Drug Treatments Seeing a Comeback in Psychiatry? This is by Ben Sessa, who's a psychiatrist who has really been focused, he's actually a child psychiatrist, but he's really been focused on engaging the community of psychiatrists around taking psychedelic drugs seriously. Psychedelic healing. Hallucinogen drugs, which blew minds in the 60s, soon may be used to treat mental ailments. So what are we actually talking about? When we use the word psychedelics, what kind of substances are we talking about? I would suggest they can be broken into three categories. There's the classical psychedelics, which are LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, and dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, which is the active ingredient of ayahuasca. So the classical psychedelics are unique in what they offer. A sense of spirituality is very common. Chris Killam's talk about ayahuasca, certainly he mentioned the, the, the spiritual component of that. It's very common. There's a disorientation of the ego. One's sense of self actually changes. And that's incredibly useful for things like alcoholism. If you absolutely believe firmly and your ego structure is built around the belief that this, this substance which is killing you is actually okay to consume, disorienting that belief system can be really helpful. The classical psychedelics are unconscious amplifiers. Essentially, they make the boundary between your conscious and your unconscious mind more permeable. You have access to stuff that you don't normally have access to, and that is incredibly useful. There is the portal effect. The portal effect is a bit like what happens when you climb Mount Everest or graduate from high school. It's that sense of accomplishing something huge, that wow, that was incredible effect. And the portal effect is really, really helpful for people who are using the psychedelic to make a transition. Substance use disorder treatment, tobacco cessation, for example, depression treatment, end of life anxiety treatment are all what the classical psychedelics are being explored for. Then there's the empathogens or intactogens. The most common word is empathogen, which essentially means connection to others. Intactogen means connection to self. But the examples are MDMA, MDA, and 3MMC, methylene dioxy amphetamine, methylene dioxy methamphetamine, and 3-methylmethcathinone. And those substances, those medicines, offer connections to others. You become very bonded in this place. 
but also the ability to reflect on self and reduce fear, and therefore it's incredibly helpful for PTSD treatment. PTSD is an unconscious tape loop. If you were a soldier and you had a really bad experience in battle, and you come back and that experience in battle is now buried in your unconscious mind and replays repetitively, it's really hard to access it. And it's hard to access it for two reasons. One is it's buried in the unconscious mind, but the other is it's surrounded by fear. So MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is the ideal treatment for PTSD. It reduces the fear and allows you to access that tape loop to rework it. And then there's everything else. From ibogaine, which is incredibly useful in the treatment from heroin addiction and other addictions. Ketamine that seems to be really helpful for the treatment of depression. In fact, it appears that ketamine will be the first drug that is be, will be used in the opening of psychedelic psychotherapy clinics. Because it is a psychedelic, then it's completely illegal, at least when it's used in medicine. 2CB, Salvadoria divinorum, are examples of the other psychedelics. Treatment for depression, substance use disorder treatment, detoxification are all examples. I'd like to talk about the study that I'm involved with, which is the MDMA-assisted psychotherapy for post-traumatic stress disorder. And where it started was Michael Mithoffer's work. So Michael Mithoffer was a therapist, a psychiatrist, who used MDMA in the treatment of PTSD. And he demonstrated an effectiveness of 83%. Now, I went to the Simver conference. The Simver is the Canadian Military Health Conference. And the people that were selling, mostly at the Canadian Military Health Conference, what they talk about is PTSD. So it's presentation after presentation after presentation on PTSD. And the people that are selling that to the military claim at best a 25% level of effectiveness. The literature says it's about 10% effective. And the dropout rate is high. Essentially, soldiers do not want to be exposed to their trauma. Flooding is the state-of-the-art treatment outside of the psychedelic world. So you take a soldier that's been exposed to a trauma, and you stick, you recreate his trauma, and you sit it in it, him in it long enough that he emotionally desensitizes. And it takes years, and the dropout rate is high. So Michael Mithoffer demonstrated an 83% level of effectiveness. Now, if I was a researcher and I was proposing a drug to be used as an alternative treatment, and the baseline standard level of effectiveness of the treatment was 10%, and I said I could do 83% level of effectiveness, and you know the literature, what you're gonna say is that researcher is lying. They are falsifying their data. That difference is unparalleled. Usually it's one, two, or three, maybe four or five percent effective or more effective when you're proposing one treatment as an alternative to another. So we had to find out if the myth offers, Michael and Annie myth offer, were actually telling the truth. So it had to be replicated. So the stage two clinical trial, the MAPS, USA, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, stage two clinical trial, was 17 sites, one in Canada, one in Vancouver, Canada. And the data has now been analyzed. Let's look at what they found. The comparative dose, the placebo effect, effectiveness was 23%. The two-month follow-up after two sessions was 55%. The two-month follow-up after three sessions was 61%. And the aggregate data for all the sites and all the subjects that went through was 67.8% effective. So it appears that Michael and Annie Mithoffer were right. This appears to be the state-of-the-art treatment for PTSD. So I was involved with the study in Vancouver. Um, we did the phase two clinical trial. We completed it. We treated six people. 
there were two teams of therapists. That data then got put into the pile, and it was so successful, we're now doing the phase three study. And as you probably know, in order for a drug to become legal, so in order for a drug to become prescribed and available through the medical profession, it has to go through stage one, two, and three clinical trials. And when it does, it becomes a legal process. So we are going to treat between 10 and 20 people in Vancouver. We'll have three teams of therapists, and we are working with another organization called the BCCSU, the British Columbia Center on Substance Use, to uh, host the clinical trial. Is ecstasy an empathogen? Now, anybody that has taken it with a loved one knows the answer to that question, but that's not good enough for science. They had to actually go and explore that technically, and yes, they decided it is an empathogen. And it also has pro-social effects. It tends to help people in terms of connection to their communities. I felt very fortunate. I signed up for the first round of MAPS therapy training. And I got to watch videotapes of Michael and Annie Mithoffer working with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy. And I was surprised at what I saw. I hadn't fully conceptualized what I saw until I, until I was there. But if I had been running the study, I probably would have cherry-picked. I would have looked for single incident trauma because I have worked in the addiction services for years, and I know that complex trauma, people who have been traumatized since a very early age in their lives, are incredibly difficult to help. So I would have found healthy young men who were soldiers, and they had had this horrible experience in battle, but they had had some resources back in their childhood experiences that they could pull on in terms of their healing process. And I was absolutely stunned by the level of complexity of the trauma and the level of severity of the symptoms that people presented with in order to be treated by Michael and Annie. I want to talk about two cases. The first one, and what we saw was all of their sessions. We sat there for 10 hours a day, five days a week. So huge number of hours of watching videotapes because they videotaped absolutely everything. There was a man who came in and he was completely delusional in his first interview. I wouldn't have taken him. But Michael and Annie saw PTSD underneath it all and they accepted him as a subject to the program. He was a first responder. He was a firefighter and he showed up at 9-11. And believe it or not, it got worse from there. It got substantially worse from there. He had been on 21 major mental health medications in the previous four years. He had had multiple diagnoses. And when he finished with working with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, he was actually able to return to work, which was amazing. I don't know if you know Vancouver, but we have an area. It's called the downtown east side. It's our open drug scene. It's, it's our trauma central in Vancouver. And I worked there for quite a few years. And it is an amazingly traumatized population. And I believe that I had heard every possible horrible story possible. There was a woman that showed up who had been treated by Michael and Annie. And she had the worst abuse story that I've ever heard. It was absolutely obnoxious. In fact, Michael and Annie had to turn off the videotape and de debrief the group of therapists and get us to settle down because it was so difficult just hearing what had happened to her. And she happened to live in the area that the training was happening, and we got to meet her. And I was absolutely thrilled because who we met was an articulate, thoughtful, self-disclosing, well-dressed, well-groomed young woman who was completely functional. By that I mean she had a stable relationship. She had had a stable relationship in her life. She was employed. She hadn't had a, a stable job in her life. And she was able to talk to us from a, a level of depth and clarity about her experiences that was absolutely unparalleled. I'd like to just uh, review some of the literature that's come out. The antidepressive, anxiolytic, anti-addictive effects 
of ayahuasca, psilocybin, and lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD, a systematic review of clinical trials published in the last 25 years. Great title. And what they said, essentially, is psychedelic drugs appear to be incredibly helpful. Here's one looking at psilocybin in the treatment of tobacco addiction. Having worked in the tobacco addiction world, I know that uh, it's really hard to get people to stop smoking tobacco. And the level of effectiveness in this study was 80-something percent. They had 15 people, and 12 of them were abstinent. And they were abstinent for a long period of time. Here's one for alcoholism. Again, alcohol addiction can be helped profoundly with psilocybin. One of my favorite studies was this one. It was looking at mystical experiences. Now, I want to show you what is actually a slide from hell. This is what you're not supposed to do when you're offering information in PowerPoint forms. But the data here is so incredible, I just have to show you some numbers. So what I want to show you is this column here was the 30 milligrams. So this is the highest dosage that they gave people. So I'm going to compare this column here to this column here, which was the 16-month follow-up. And I want you to look at the numbers. Because what you see is the numbers that I have indicated in those two columns. The number in the right-hand column goes up. So things like, was this the most spiritual experience of your life? Or was this the, this the most meaningful experience of your life? 16 months later, those numbers went up. Now, I can't think of any medical or counseling or therapeutic intervention that increases with time. So I believe this is absolutely, completely unique. So that's within the lab. Those are research that happens in the context of therapy. But it's also interesting to see what happens when people take psychedelics generally in the community. And there's two studies that I'd like to talk about. This was one looking at recidivism, which is going back to jail after you've been in jail. And they, they asked people, what drugs do you take before they went in jail? So the national, not the National Health Survey, but the, um, the corrections institution has that information. And you can look at the folks that use what drugs and whether or not they go back to jail. And this was a study that looked at 25,000 records. Now, what we know that prevents recidivism is stable family housing and employment. This study observed that the use of psychedelic drugs was more protective against recidivism than stable family housing and employment. So the same researcher went into the National Health Survey database and had 190,000 records, and he looked at suicidality. And what he observed was that psychedelic drugs seem to be protective against suicidality. And this is just use in the natural population. This is normal use. This is not use that's given by therapists. And this one I like because of the title is so cool. The efficacy, tolerability, tolerability and safety of serotonergic psychedelics for the management of mood, anxiety, and substance use disorders, a systematic review of systematic reviews. <laughs> and what they said is they appear to be helpful. Here is a study that looked at brain function and came up with this image. And this is looking at the psilocybin seems to increase connectivity in the brain. The outside multicolored sphere is the different parts of the brain that what you notice in the left-hand image tend to talk a lot to the other part, to, their, to themselves. But they can become a lot more conversational with the other parts of the brain after an experience of psilocybin. So psychedelics are all about connections. Connections to self, connections to others, connections to family, connections to spirit, connections to meaning and purpose to life. What I observe is that cannabis is being legalized through popular public support. When 50% of Canadians decided that they thought cannabis should be legalized, Justin Trudeau stepped up and said he would do it. Opiates are being legalized because of the fentanyl health crisis. Slowly, it is becoming observed to be a prohibition problem. But psychedelics are being legalized through the stage one, two, and three clinical trials. 
And we're about four years away from MDMA being legal as a treatment for PTSD. I'm very interested in how psychedelics should be legalized. We know they're going to be through the stage one and two and three clinical trials. So I wrote a paper exploring how I believe that psychedelics should be legalized through the lens of public health. All drugs, the harms of all drugs can be put into three categories. Dependency, potential, toxicity, and behavior. As you probably know, the dependency potential for psychedelics is almost zero. The toxicity is incredibly low, so it's all about behavior. So if all of the harms of psychedelics have to do with behavior, what we need to do is to create a new profession. And the profession, I would suggest, should be called psychedelic supervisors. They should be a professional body. They should report to a college in the same way that physicians report to a professional body. They should adhere to best practices, and they should be allowed to have specialties, everything from PTSD treatment to offering ayahuasca ceremonies to providing management of multi-day music festivals to psychedelic group experiences for payment. These are paid professionals. What they generally be responsible for is screening of participants, preventing driving under the influence, and they would be essentially responsible for set, setting safety and dosage issues for eight, eight hours after ingestion. And they would agree to work with other professionals in their body, in their group of professionals, to develop and help people to adhere to best practices. Now, I presented that idea at lots of conferences. And I would always get somebody standing up at the back saying, I love psychedelics. And what I do with my wife, husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, partner, under the influence of psychedelics, I don't want supervised. And I had to respond to that. So I believe there should be a second track, which would be a, a certification process that allows people to self-supervise or supervise friends. So if you want to be paid for the service, you need to be a licensed professional. But if you'd just like to have the experience, you would be allowed after about a two-weekend course. One weekend would be devoted to things like set, setting, safety, and dosage issues. And the second weekend would be experiential. We had to go watch somebody um, guiding a session, and you'd participate in that. The most difficult part for us was how do we talk about access to youth? And to answer that question, we went to the Aboriginal communities and noticed in Indigenous communities, it was inconsistent. Ayahuasca communities often have pregnant women showing up, and they show up with their newborns, and they show up with their toddlers. It's just done in community. There's no age restrictions. With the peyote folks, often there was an age restriction. It was about puberty. When you became a man or a woman, then you would get to participate in the event. We looked at how youth could access alcohol and noticed that in a number of states, legally, you can if you have parental supervision. We looked at how youth access health, ser health services in British Columbia, and they have a term called mature minor. It doesn't matter how old you are. It matters whether or not you understand the service that you're asking for. And so we came up with a model that was kind of a blend of all of those. And what we said was if somebody, if a youth, showed up and wanted to participate in a psychedelic experience, and they were mature enough to ask for it and know what they were asking, that they would be allowed to grant, to, to experience the services if they first went to their parents and said, would you like to, uh, would you like to participate? But if the parents didn't want to, they could access it if it was available from a person who was trained in how to manage the experience for youth. Essentially, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a certificate, a cert certified psychedelic psychotherapist. Hopefully, MAPS and MAPS Canada will be offering those certifications in the not too distant future. And at the end of the day, what we are hoping to open, this is the vision of the future. We are hoping to open the psychedelic therapy clinics. We're hoping to open them all across Canada and the United States. We will probably start with ketamine, and then slowly we'll add the different psychedelics to the 
range of different experiences that we offer. And for those folks who are thinking that looks way too urban to me, we will also offer the experience in a rural environment. <laughs> One does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a long time. The saddest aspect of life now is that science gathers knowledge faster than society gathers wisdom. Thank you.